All right. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. My name is Kevin McCabe with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. I'd like to welcome you all to, do, to you all to today's webinar, again hosted by the Clean Energy Ministerial's Carbon Capture, Utilization, and Storage, or CCUS, initiative. We have a, another great event lined up today, as this particular webinar is brought to you in collaboration with the Innovation for Cool Earth Forum, or ISIF. Representatives from ISIF, academia, and the Department of Energy's National Laboratory System will be discussing biomass carbon removal and storage, or bikers. Lots to get to in just one hour, so let's quickly review some housekeeping items uh, before diving right into the presentations and discussions. Uh, if you can currently hear me, then you have already successfully connected to the audio for this event. Uh, however, and, and perhaps most importantly, if at any point you encounter technical difficulties with the webinar platform, you may contact the GoToWebinars help desk at the number shown on the screen. That is 888-259-3826, and they should be able to provide most types of audio video support. We encourage all attendees to submit their questions at any point during the webinar. Just use the questions pane of the GoToWebinar platform, and the moderators will do their best to address as many as possible. Shortly following the conclusion of the event, the video recording will be added to our YouTube channel, and the presentation slides will be uploaded to the Clean Energy Solutions Center site, links for which can be found here. And a quick reminder before uh, taking a look at our agenda for today um, that the recordings from previous webinars held by the CCUS initiative uh, are hosted in a dedicated YouTube playlist. The link on this slide will take you to the playlist or perhaps easiest, uh, simply search for Clean Energy Solutions Center on YouTube and click on the playlist tab. The SEM CCUS video playlist can be found there. Uh, before we jump into the presentation portion of our event, I'll provide a, a quick int introduction of today's panelists, followed by some brief welcoming statements uh, from both Jared Daniels of the SEM CCUS Initiative and the U.S. Department of, Department of Energy, and Nobuo Tanaka of the Sasakawa Peace Foundation and ISEF, who will provide some context for today's webinar. Then, following the panelists' presentations, Jared will moderate the panel discussion and Q&A session, where the panelists will address questions submitted by the audience and engage in a discussion of topics relevant to today's presentations. Our first speaker today will be uh, Jared Daniels, uh, who leads the Office of Strategic Planning, Analysis, and Engagement with the United, within the United States Department of, Department of Energy, Office of Fossil Energy. Following Jared will be Nabuo Tanaka, former chairman and current special advisor for the Sasakawa Peace Foundation, as well as the chairman of the Innovation for Cool Earth Forum, ISIF. Also joining us today is David Sandalo, inaugural fellow at the Center on Global Energy Policy and co-director of the Energy Environment Concentration at the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. We will also hear from Dr. Julio Friedman, senior research scholar at the Center for Global Clean Energy Policy at Columbia University and CEO of Carbon Wrangler, LLC. And finally, we will also be joined by Roger Ains, Chief Scientist of the Energy Program at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, where he also leads the Carbon Initiative. And with those brief introductions, I would now like to welcome Jared to the webinar. Jared. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Kevin, and thank you for the introduction, and thank you all for the audience for taking your time to be with us today. I'll provide uh, just a, a couple of slides and to frame what our uh, Clean Energy Ministerial CCUS uh, initiative is all about. Kevin, if you can advance to the, the next slide. Um, the Clean Energy Ministerial is essentially a global process. It represents uh, 27 uh, Clean Energy Ministerial members representing 90% of clean energy investments and about three quarters of global CO2 emissions currently. Um, and it's really a forum to work together and do good to address uh, climate change mitigation. Several years ago, we stood up an effort to focus on carbon capture, utilization, storage, uh, the SEM CCUS initiative. Uh, it's led by uh, Norway, Saudi Arabia, the United States, and the United Kingdom. And you can see the flags there on the right of this slide in terms of the partners uh, in the government sense uh, that we coordinate and work with. And we also work with uh, leaders from industry uh, and the financial sector as well. Kevin, next slide. And we stood this up because, you know, we said if all of the modeling and all of the analysis says the CCUS is an absolutely critical part of achieving our net zero goals and getting us on a path to sustainability mid-century, it should be part of that clean energy ministerial process and conversation um, and, and communication in terms of the importance of all of these low carbon technologies 
working in unison. So our initiative is really about working together to accelerate CCUS uh, development and deployment. We want it to be actively included in that broader conversation, again, because all the math says it's absolutely critical to be so. Um, we want to bring together governments and industry and the investment community to, again, work together to advance and accelerate CCUS deployment broadly uh, in many regions of the globe. We want to be able to work together to facilitate um, long-term and near-term investment opportunities to deploy CCUS um, across all aspects where CCUS can be of value in the power sector and hard to obey carbon uh, intensive industries and, and you know more broadly. And finally, we want to use tools and webinars like this to disseminate best practices, whether it's best practices in policy or regulation, best practices in technology deployment. That's what we're all about. So hopefully that gives you a big picture of the SEM CCUS initiative and what our focus is. Kevin, on the next slide, um, I'll just note for the record here that there was a recent uh, clean energy uh, ministerial, the 12th, and we've got several uh, available products out there that you can look at and get more up to speed if you wish in terms of your understanding of CCUS. The first one was a, a high level fireside chat that I moderated with several energy ministers um, talking about how CCUS fits into uh, their uh, net zero goals and, and plans moving forward. Uh, the second uh, piece out there is, is basically a CCUS 101 with some of the leading minds and organizations around the global CCUS community talking about you know basics of carbon capture and carbon storage. And then the third uh, um, piece that's out there and available to download and take a look at are stakeholder testimonies where we've got uh, entity, a bank or uh, industry associations or some specific companies that talk about how they view CCS fitting into their overall uh, strategy to get to net zero. Um, so I put those out there. You can see the where the recordings are available and I welcome everyone to take a look if you uh, think that they may be a benefit to you. So with that as a broad over, uh, overview, I will now turn the, the floor over to Nobuo Teka um, for his presentation and then right into our discussion. Nobuo, please. Thank you, Jared. Uh, please uh, advance one slide, please. Um, I, thank you really for inviting me to share the result of the Innovation for Cool Earth Forum, ICEF 2020. I'm Nobuo Tanaka, the chairman of the steering committee and also the former executive director of the IEA. Next slide, please. Um, ISEF was created in 2014 by the former prime minister Shinzo Abe to raise awareness and promote discussion on innovation in energy and environmental technologies. And uh, David Sandalo has been one of the prominent members of the steering group and a leader of the roadmap project. Next slide, please. The last year's uh, 2020's uh, theme was action toward beyond zero emission society in light of COVID-19 with a focus on gender equality. Uh, as our, one of our, our output, I have published uh, roadmaps on critical technologies which are deemed to have significant impacts on the decarbonization and uh, covering energy storage, ZEV, ZEV, um, DAC, industrial heat, and most recently, these bikers. The next slide, please. This is the subject of today. You will find uh, this biological uh, the removal of carbon is a very interesting subject. Next slide, please. This is the IEA's uh, finding about uh, the COVID-19 and its impact to the energy market. Uh, it hit, uh, the COVID-19 hit energy sector by once in 100 years scale and 30% of the global oil demand disappeared uh, by lockdowns. Uh, last year, the Fatih Birol of the executive director of the IEA called it it's a black April for oil sector. Now, all fossil and nuclear was hit but the uh, sole winner was uh, renewables. So I'm really surprised that the party is getting more, more optimistic about the carbon neutrality toward uh, 2050. Next slide, please. And IEA surprised again, all of us, especially in the oil and gas sector uh, by the recent net zero by 2050 uh, report or roadmap. It is as big as an oil shock in 1973. I may call it IEA shock. The next slide, please. 
Due to the roadmap, uh, miles, uh, milestones are set uh, from 2021 to 2050. And uh, one of the uh, earliest one was uh, in 2021, uh, this year, we have to stop investing in the new project of oil and gas. And also it shows that uh, we have to remove carbon dioxide 4.9 gigaton in 2030 and 7.6 gigaton in 2050. The next slide, please. Also roadmap, talk about DAX and BEX, and they expected to remove 1.9 gigaton in 2050 by this roadmap. Bikers, at the, uh, same, at the, on the other hand, may increase the number significantly because our report is calling that maybe uh, bikers may remove 2.5 to 5 gigaton of CO2 by 2050. Next slide, please. Backlaff's meal. Uh, here's another ICEF steering committee member said, any energy source needs many, many years to take over the energy world. Transformation takes years. The coal needs 60 years to cover 50% of the energy demand after hitting 5% th threshold. Oil needed same year to reach 40%. How will be the case for the new renewables? Will it enhance the very fast energy transformation, we will see. The difficulty comes from the hard to hit abate sectors. Next slide, please. One more click, please. Yes, uh, this is uh, showing that uh, renewable can do a lot, but the, uh, there are many difficult hard to abate sectors like coal, uh, uh, power sector, uh, and uh, trans heavy transportation, etc. One more slide, please. And uh, this is, takes years to really uh, remove ca carbon dioxide from these sectors. One more. The problem is Asian uh, growing uh, countries because their infrastructure is relatively new and may take much, much longer years compared to the uh, developed economies to take care of these hard to abate sectors. And in our view that hydrogen, a clean hydrogen may help to abate uh, these sectors. Next slide, please. Prime Minister Suga announced in Japan that carbon neutral will be uh, the target for 2050 last uh, October. And this is a really uh, game changer in Japan. And uh, this uh, graph shows that the uh, energy outlook to achieve carbon neutrality in 2050. The first decarbonizing totally the power sector and eventually uh, removing uh, as much carbon in the industrial using sector. But there are hardest core places. So the issue of uh, plantation, ducks or bikers may need for the last result of decarbonization. The next slide, please. This is the 14 uh, sector sectoral industrial policy to achieve carbon neutrality. There are lots of hydrogen mentioned, fuel, ammonia, hydrogen, even nuclear power is expected to produce a clean hydrogen, fuel cell, vehicle, etc. One must push slide. Yes, and this shows that maybe we are heading toward the golden age of hydrogen. The next slide, please. And to make the golden age, the important thing is how to use renewables all over the world. And the cost of renewable energy is getting less and less. Uh, and green hydrogen is available all over the world. And another way is blue hydrogen, the capturing CO2 and make a clean hydrogen from the fossil fuel. That, that's the right, right part of the slides. But how to move this green or blue hydrogen from this producing sector? Next slide, please. Trading of hydrogen is what Japan is aiming at. Um, in fact, uh, Japan started importing LNG 50 years ago to replace oil as cleaner fuel. And this is a great success story of energy trading. 
But in the near future, Japan needs to switch from trading LNG to green or blue hydrogen from Middle East, Australia, or the United States. Uh, this, uh, there are alternatives of this uh, storage and transportation, uh, namely ammonia or organic hydrate or MCH and liquid hydrogen. The next slide, please. Last but not least, the gender equality is a message from ICEF. The COVID-19 hit women more than men, but women leaders can manage it better than men. Next slide, please. Not only COVID-19, the climate change is not gender neutral. So it impacts women more than men, especially in the developing countries. But ICEF finds that gender diversity positively correlates to better climate governance and innovation. To impact on the corporate decisions, uh, corporate boards needs more than 30% women members. The next slide, please. This is the ICEF 2020, uh, last year's infographics. We have to quickly go down from 60 gigaton CO2 equivalent to beyond zero. The key technologies are here. The hydrogen, batteries, CCUS, SML, the carbon recycle like bikers. But more importantly, there are only female figures there to plan and guide us to the target. I hope there are many uh, women participating in uh, the audience and uh, the experience for the sustainability. The last slide, please. This is a notice for ICEF 2021. Uh, next October, we will have a focusing on uh, the pathway to carbon neutrality by 2050 and accelerating the pace of global decarbonization. And uh, this year's roadmap, which is led by, uh, again, David Sandalo, is carbon mineralization. Thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity to introduce ICEF. And Kevin, I think if we could advance to the next slide and our next guest speaker. And David, well, thank is that you? you very much. Hi, I'm, I'm David Sandalow, and uh, maybe go back to the previous slide. Uh, I, I want to thank Nabuo Tanaka for his extraordinary leadership of the Innovation for Cool Earth Forum. Uh, under Nabuo's leadership, ICEP has been focusing on net zero emissions or carbon neutrality for several years, really ahead of the curve. Uh, the, the world has started focusing on this in the past year in ways that it hasn't before. And I think, Nabuo, you, you've helped shape the global agenda on this with what you've done at ISEF. And really, we're very grateful for everything you've done here. Uh, I also want to thank Jared and Kevin for the work of the Clean Energy Ministerial CCUS initiative. It's really rewarding and exciting to see all the great work underway in this initiative. And we're thrilled to have this opportunity to speak to all of you about the, the roadmap that we developed last year on biomass carbon removal and storage. Um, and thrilled to be here with two of two of our co-authors on this, uh, Julio Friedman and Roger Ains. Um, next slide, please. So we started out, uh, Julio, Roger, and I, and a couple of other co-authors about a year and a half ago now to write a, a roadmap on, on BEX, which is a term that I suspect is familiar to many people in the webinar today, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. And um, BEX has been part of the climate dialogue for decades. It's, it's a very important part of many integrated assessment models looking at how we get to net zero emissions. Next slide, please. But the more, as we dove into BEX and, and thought about how we could shape a useful roadmap on this topic, we came to the conclusion that the term BEX misses two key points. And the first one is that biomass can be used to capture and store CO2 uh, without energy production. We can use biochar, for example, which is an important way to use bio, um, biomass to, to store carbon over the long term, but does not involve energy production per se. Um, and then second, and this is a key point, I think, the carbon removal value of biomass can often exceed uh, it, its energy value. Uh, plants are extremely good stores of um, carbon it, they're less good as energy producers. Um, and, and so imagine as we look forward several decades and as the world needs to hit net zero emissions, the, the value of biomass 
before carbon removal may well exceed its energy value. So why are we using a term uh, that focuses on energy uh, as opposed to uh, carbon re removal more broadly? Next slide, please. So the result, we propose this new term, biomass carbon removal and storage, which we call bikers. Uh, next slide. Another key point, and this runs throughout our roadmap, you can hear more about this, is that using biomass for carbon capture and storage does create risks, um, creates risks of higher food prices, ecosystem damage, including biodiversity loss and adverse impacts on rural livelihoods. It's been very controversial in a number of different settings. Uh, next slide. Um, and, and then kind of key to this is that CO2 removal benefits um, of bikers or BECs can be reduced or eliminated by indirect land use change. Um, if you use uh, use biomass to remove carbon in one location, uh, there may there may well be implications um, for land use in far distant locations as a result of uh, indirect pressures in the food chain. Next slide. So we propose three guiding principles for bikers in our roadmap. First is do no harm. Uh, second, social acceptability is key. Um, this, as much as any area that, that I've studied in, in decarbonization, uh, requires involvement of communities and social acceptability. And third, technology development should reflect social priorities. Next slide. And with this, I will turn it over to my esteemed colleague, uh, Dr. Julio Friedman. Thank you, David. Uh, and thank you again to the SEM and to Tanaka-san for uh, the opportunity to be here today. Uh, many of you are sitting there asking yourselves, so what exactly is bikers? Uh, how is this different from BEX and so forth? So we offer a helpful definition at the top of the roadmap. The first is that the use of biomass is first removing CO2 from the air and oceans. Second is that it takes that carbon and basically pulls it out for an indefinite period of time. It stores CO2 underground or in long-lived products or in the deep ocean where it does not re-enter the atmosphere. And then finally, it does no harm. Uh, as David said earlier, this is an essential part of the framing for bikers uh, that you cannot, it must not move forward at the expense of food security or rural livelihoods or biodiversity or similar important values. Next slide, please. Uh, I sincerely hope you take a look at the roadmap. We wrote uh, an ideal vision of what this might look like in 2050 to represent how this might be done well. Uh, it is often the case where people imagine how this can be done poorly. There's good grounds for that imagining. Uh, we wanted to provide a counterbalancing idea of what bikers done correctly might look like. Next slide. Uh, a few of the key points. First is, as Tanaka-san mentioned, uh, we think that the opportunity here is large in terms of removal, two and a half to five gigatons of credible and reasonable potential by mid-century. Uh, importantly, two things follow, follow immediately from that. One is that the big issues here are not technical. They are, in fact, about governments, uh, governance, they are about institutional operation, they are political, and therefore the focus must proceed on that aspect of bikers. Second, and this is extremely important, we start with wastes. Uh, we are not talking about dedicated fuel crops. And part of the reason why is because we're not so interested in the energy. The energy's got some useful things in there. We might get it here and there, but we're really interested in the carbon. So we're focusing on agricultural, forestry, and municipal wastes. It is also the case that micro and macro algae could be significant contributors to bikers. Um, in addition to that, the carbon stock itself could go, uh, can in fact uh, displace food, uh, can create bad outcomes, and that's part of the reason to focus on the governance issues right up front. Next slide, please. Uh, on that basis, this is a central message. If you're going to deploy this technology, standards are the work today. We need to develop global and regional standards for the harvesting, disposition of biomass to avoid those risks. If you know that there's something you want to avoid, you got to set it out up front. Again, this is a governance question as much as anything else. 
Uh, next point uh, helps with that. The technology to monitor biomass production and global trade has gotten really good. You can track every single ship in the world through their transponder. You can track every single tree in the world through satellites. We now have a capability so that we can avoid terrible outcomes through sensible application of technology under the framework of those standards. Uh, finally, we've said this many times, but it's central for bikers to be a valuable and contributing member of a sustainable world. Do no harm. This cannot go forward at the expense of rural communities. This cannot go forward at the expense uh, of people's livelihoods and nourishment. Next slide, please. Again, so just a little bit of background here. You all know that biomass can be used for carbon removal without energy production. You're probably sitting on a chair made of wood now. If you're not, there's some aspect of wood in your home. Uh, and in fact, uh, carbon can be stored that way. It can be stored in many things. For example, as Dr. Sandalo mentioned, biochar, uh, which is a soil amendment, is one way of storing carbon without harvesting the energy. There's an increasingly novel approaches to this. One is essentially putting biomass into a great big blender and injecting it in the deep subsurface, making a bioliquid and storing that instead of the CO2. So instead of free phase carbon dioxide, you're injecting the biomass directly. It is also possible to dispatch marine macroalgae, uh, negatively buoyant kelp, if you will, to the abyssal plain, uh, where it will again enter the geological record. It is also possible to add carbon fibers directly to concrete that can strengthen them as well as reduce the carbon footprint. Uh, all of these are possible without conversion to energy. That's worth thinking about. Next slide in large part because biomass is a pretty crappy energy product. Um, uh, and in that context, if you think about any kind of carbon price, uh, the value of carbon mass removal exceeds the energy value pretty quickly. This we call the Ains principle uh, in honor of our founder and our co-author, Roger Ains, who hit upon this very simple notion. And if you look at the energy content and the price of various fuels, ranging from wood pellets to coal to oil to gas, at fairly modest carbon prices, the biomass carbon removal value exceeds its energy value. In the case of uh, uh, very, fairly low value energy stocks like uh, wood pellets and so forth, this happens at basically a carbon price of about 20 bucks a ton, well in exceeds, by excess of what existing carbon prices are the European market, uh, the low carbon fuel standard in California, the $170 carbon price in Canada, et cetera. Um, because this energy value is so low, it's helpful to reimagine biomass as a conveyor belt, which captures CO2 from the air and oceans and translates it into a lockup. Next slide. This led us to, again, uh, reimagine biomass as a biker's opportunity. Next slide. Again, right. Part of the reason we thought this was important is because we simply need a lot of negative removals. Uh, according to the IPCC scenario uh, in 2018, this is the one and a half degree scenario, we must remove uh, between 100 billion and a trillion tons of CO2 from the air and oceans over the next century. That's simply an enormous volume. Uh, for comparison, the global oil and gas industry is 5 billion tons. So we're talking about much larger numbers. This looks like an annual value of, say, 5 to 10 billion tons of removal uh, by 2030. It's simply an enormous, enormous volume. This is comparable, again, to the numbers that were in the IEA scenario that uh, Nobuo just mentioned, uh, where you're talking about uh, multiple gigatons of CO2 removal by mid-century. It is also important to realize that if we fail at any abatement pathway to hit these targets, we must do more of it. If we fail at hydrogen deployment, if we fail at renewable deployment, if we sail, fail at our efficiency goals, if we fail at conventional carbon capture, if we fail at nuclear, any place we fail, we're going to need more of this. So it's important to understand what is reasonable in terms of CO2 removal scale up. Next slide. Uh, as David mentioned, there are real risks associated with this. Rather than paper over them, this report spends a lot of time discussing those risks and 
head on thinking about ways to manage them. There's uh, a particular risk which has become more acute lately, that of eco-colonialism, in which uh, wealthy countries take advantage of the global south and use their biomass in a harmful way. Uh, and uh, we are keenly interested in avoiding such things as we scale the global enterprise. Next slide. Again, uh, with that, uh, I thank you for your time and attention and hand the microphone to our, our colleague, Dr. Eames. Thank you, Julio. Thank you all. So the an important question here is how much biomass is really available to do this? And it turns out that this is a number that has not been evaluated on a global basis all that accurately. There have been a number of assessments of the energy value of, of biomass, but this question of how much waste biomass is available is less well strained. The things we considered, of course, starting with waste biomass, it turns out there's an enormous amount of organic waste that is disposed of today, much of which turns into CO2 or worse into methane. And so there's double advantages of using that organic biomass as a feedstock. It may be possible that dedicated crops are useful in the future, um, obviously constrained by the use of land for food, but we think that the waste biomass uh, amounts to begin with is so large that we don't need to start this process with any dedicated crops and we may, may, may never need them and hopefully we'll have good rules in place for controlling their impact if people do want to use them. Managed forests in particular are a place that can provide a significant amount of biomass it's, which is being moved in a global biomass system today which we think is is considerably suboptimal in terms of carbon removal so uh, that's an important thing for us to look at how can we get more carbon out of the existing biomass that's moving around the world next slide The best estimate that we've been able to come up with is that on the order of two and a half to five gigatons of carbon dioxide could be removed using waste material that's available today. That depends upon the, where you get the waste. It also depends upon the actual conversion process that you use to get that CO2. For instance, if you just took it and turned it into a pyrolysis liquid and injected it underground, you'd get all of it. Or if you used biomass to make hydrogen, you'd get all of the uh, carbon in the biomass. And so that's where the maximum removals would come from. There are higher estimates. We don't think those are credible. We think it's perfectly reasonable to talk about this as being a maximum amount, which means it doesn't solve every problem in the world. And guess what? There are no technologies that actually do that. Next slide. Next. Carbon capture and storage is going to be critical to this. Two and a half to five gigatons is more than can be stored in natural systems. It's going to need to go back underground. And the good news is that CO2 storage exists in good proximity to biomass availability in a lot of areas. However, transportation is going to be important, and that's a part that's going to have to be worked out. The both local transportation of things like CO2 and global transportation of biomass. The creation of infrastructure to do that, pipelines, assess storage, is critical. Today, there's nowhere near enough storage and infrastructure to move this amount of CO2, and that's a job for the governments of the world. Next. This carbon capture and storage map you're probably familiar with. There is a lot of opportunity around the world, and this corresponds with places where people are eager to convert biomass as well. And so we think there's a good technical potential. We think this is something that with good international rules, the business community can pick up in a hurry. And the international rules relate back to the fact that companies that want to pay for this or countries that want to pay for this may not be the only place that they may be getting biomass from other places or they may be a place like the United States is currently a biomass supplier to much of the world. It's very important to have consistent rules so that everyone knows that they're getting the actual carbon removals that they're paying for. Next. Geologic storage is not the only thing though, and, and we hope that other new forms of long-term storage will evolve. Biochar, 
you're familiar with. Engineered wood products is one that we think can grow considerably, and that can it grow in, in concert with these other methods that we're talking about. And there may be other things, bioplastic, uh, putting carbon into long-term concrete is a topic that you're hearing a lot about today. And we hope that there will be new topics as well. But again, this comes back to the standards question of how long is that carbon held in that material? Is it long enough to be really considered a removal? Next. So the research that needs to be done by the worldwide community is, falls in technology, importantly in social science, integrated analysis, and in the timeline. Next. There's a lot of new technology that is appropriate to develop here. Using biomass to supply hydrogen is probably the most important one in the whole sector because if you remove the hydrogen from biomass, you get all the carbon dioxide for storage and you get a valuable energy product, clean energy product uh, in the form of the hydrogen. So this is a terrific new way that people can obtain double benefit. Working on these other new pathways for long-term storage is a, is a uh, pursuit for academic development right now. And you're seeing new companies come into the, the uh, world market doing this. Fast pyrolysis, this method of Converting biomass into liquid is an important way to not only do the thing that Julio mentioned of potentially injecting it underground, but also to make it easier to transport biomass because of course we're talking about an enormous volume of biomass that may have to be moved around. Satellite monitoring, this idea of monitoring every tree, I love that Julio, that's a great uh, uh, way to talk about it. This is something that's going to be important for purchasers of biomass to be sure that they're getting the environmentally appropriate biomass that they, they believe that they're buying. And of course, there are opportunities to make our plants better, in particular to combine soil carbon with the kind of above ground carbon management that we're talking about. Next. An unheralded aspect of this is that this is a social science problem. And we can condense this problem into the question of who controls the biomass, who benefits from the use of the biomass, and where are those benefits located? These are topics that must be resolved. We can't, as we say, have global colonialism. We can't be harvesting the world's biomass and using it for the benefit of the few wealthy countries today. And so this is something that has to be not only studied, but has to be clearly described and the rules for how we're going to uh, control those benefits are very important. Communities are going to have opportunities for new jobs, but there are also risks for their ecosystems. And this is something that we've understood uh, for a long time, how the, these things can go wrong. Now it's important to figure out how they can be done correctly. Next. This is going to involve multiple disciplines. We're going to have to combine fields, uh, you know, agriculture and nutrition, engineering, things that this is this is combining the worldwide knowledge scale uh, on a way that we we really haven't seen in any other topic. We probably should have, but we're going to do it right here if we if we really want to make this happen. And increasingly relying on communities that want to do this job and that do so in a fair and equitable way is going to be incredibly important. Next. We're gonna to have to do the right integrated analysis. Um, this is a worldwide topic. This is one where the uh, carbon removal, the economics, the energy that's involved in whatever conversion project you get right has gotta be evaluated on a worldwide scale. And we can't pretend that it's just a local problem that, and this is where we get displacement effects and additionality effects. We have to have a worldwide analysis. Next. Satellites are going to be super important for tracking this. You're starting to see this in the literature, and this is really pretty fun. We're, we're not going to have to guess what's going on with uh, biomass in the southeast United States. We can actually track it in great detail, and so we don't have to accept people's promises. We can actually have data here. Next. With that, turn it back to David. Thanks, Roger. I'll, I'll close us out quickly here so we can turn to, to your questions. Um, policy support is going to be absolutely essential in making bikers scale in the decades ahead. And, and first, most fundamentally, we need incentives for removing carbon from the atmosphere. 
uh, we, we need emissions trading programs, tax policies, or, or mandates to make sure that governments help provide the policy framework uh, that, that provides incentives. Um, second, support for R&D &D is going to be important. Government spending and, and deployment through tax incentive, grants, loans, guarantees, and procurement. Uh, procurement, by the way, is a really important piece of this. And then third, uh, standard setting. Uh, there are complex issues involving measurement of life cycle emissions, uh, leakage issues, um, reporting and verification issues. All having confidence in all of those is going to be important for bikers to scale. Um, and a, a UN framework convention on climate change platform for bikers or a clean energy ministerial platform for bikers could really make a big difference. Next slide. So we offer uh, findings and recommendations. Um, uh, our, our first, and just to run through them quickly again to wrap up, we believe uh, bikers could deliver two and a half to five gigatons of CO2 removal by mid-century. That is, you know, of course, around 10% of global emissions today, or five to 10% uh, of, of total greenhouse gas emissions. This is a very important potential. The biggest issues to be addressed are institutional and political, not technical. Um, wastes are the most important and attractive sources. Timber um, or dedicated energy crops for carbon removal create risks. Um, next slide. Widespread adoption of sustainable biomass standards will be needed to address these risks. Uh, technologies are available to monitor biomass production and help ensure good practices. And most fundamentally, a core principle, do no harm. Next slide. Uh, this is um, the, the most recent roadmap in, in a series of roadmaps sponsored by the Innovation for Cool Earth Forum. Here's, uh, here's a list of them. As uh, Nabuo Tanaka said at the beginning, we're currently working on one involving carbon mineralization. If you're interested in that, please reach out to us. Next slide. Uh, and with that, I will turn it back to our moderator, uh, Jared. Wonderful. Well, thank you, David, and thank you to all our guest speakers for really walking us through that. Uh, Tanaka-san for setting the stage of, of you know, what ICEF is focused on and some of these broader issues, and then you know, David and Julio and Roger for walking us through this uh, this biomass carbon removal concept and your thoughts on that um, in general and in specific. Um, wonderful presentation, and we've got some time here from questions uh, and your responses. Uh, We've had a number of questions come in from the audience. Several of them are related to the financial aspects in terms of how do you get this uh, to take a foothold and contribute to our, our goals and ambitions. Um, you know, I'll note that there's still carbon markets that currently exist, right, where people trade on uh, carbon offsets or carbon reductions. One of the general questions is, you know, how do you trade on, on this type of, of uh, carbon removal? Roger, you mentioned the need for standards, and so it'd be appreciative of your views on what those could or should look like and how those can help. Uh, you mentioned one of the key principles is, you know, waste biomass as a start. Um, there's a lot of advantages on that, but that I think would help with the financial aspects perhaps. And finally, a question came in and that said, you know, how do you start this given that the current the, the current global price on CO2 emission reduction is is much lower than some of the data in the curves that you showed here? So maybe an open question and each of our panelists can can respond just on those financial aspects. Where do we start and what do you think the the key um, issues are in terms of standards and the use of waste to start? And um, given the low price point, how do we begin? Maybe uh, David, we could turn to, to you first and then maybe Julio and Roger could could follow? Really, the, 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 boy, they're great questions. Uh, how, how long have you got is my first question. I, I, uh, like, I think- Why don't we take a couple of minutes, you know, a minute or so for each of you and then we'll get to the next question, but this is an important topic, so please go ahead. Great. Um, uh, let me just touch on a couple of pieces of this and then turn it to, to uh, Julio and to Roger. So, so first, um, the role of government's gonna be really key, I think, and, and uh, car carbon prices are gonna be very important in helping to, to make this market. Um, I think uh, voluntary corporate compliance can play an important role, but I think carbon prices set by governments uh, or policies that do the functional equivalent are, are going to be very important. Then government financing for scale up um, is going to be important as well. So both for deployment and for um, for research um, in some of these areas. Um, and, and then 
uh, this, the standard setting function that, that we talked about in our presentation is going to be absolutely essential. I think, and that needs to proceed from the ground up. Um, and, and I think we, that needs to involve a combination of uh, the research community and policy makers. Um, and eventually, it's going to need to be embraced by groups of nations and ultimately globally uh, for this to scale. Uh, so let, a lot more to say, but let me, let me just pause with that and turn it over to Julio or Roger, whoever wants to jump in. Why don't, why don't I go next? Uh, let me talk about, uh, first of all, how do you get paid? This is an excellent question um, and an essential one. Uh, where this is going to have to head is compliance market. We do not need a global price on carbon to do this. We have markets already where you can get paid. We've got 45Q in the United States. We've got the low carbon fuel standard. We've got the ETS. Those prices today are plenty high enough, but it is the case that bikers is not a compliance mechanism in those markets. For in general, that's true. Uh, so if you converted biomass to energy and captured the CO2 and stored it, you could get paid by the ETS or by uh, 45Q. If you did one of the other pathways to bikers, you can't. Not in scope. So there has to be some uh, amendment of existing statute to have a wider aperture. That is also going to help move the standards along. And one of the questions noted that there are some commercial outfits that have uh, certification pathways and they have their own protocols, groups like Puro and Nori, for example. Those things are really tuned right now to nature based solutions. So they're really temporary storage of biomass on the Earth's surface, not permanent storage of biomolecules uh, in geological formations. Uh, and so uh, even though they have very sensitive, sensitive and sophisticated pathways, again, Bikers largely sits outside of those markets and those opportunities. Uh, I got to say this clearly for anybody listening, having a blockchain tracking this doesn't help. You actually need to make sure that you have the carbon first. You got to lead with the carbon removal. You got to document that that's well. And this is again where the development of standards is absolutely essential. It is unglamorous. It is laborious. It takes time and experts and working groups. But that's how these things move in the world. And let me talk Wonderful. about. Thanks, Julio. Yeah, I was going to say, Roger, I know you've got uh, some thoughts on standards. I'd love for you to go into that a little bit as well. Well, I wanted to talk for a minute on price. That, that just because we're saying you should focus on carbon removal doesn't mean you should ignore the value of, of other things you can do with these things, including creating energy. And so one of the things that we've looked at uh, at my lab is to say, if we convert biomass into hydrogen, how much does it cost to sell the, if you sell that hydrogen and then and then pay for the CO2 removal. And the answer is it's between $40 and $80 a ton to pay to get the CO2 underground. That's a pretty reasonable uh, price. You're taking the advantage of the value of the hydrogen, but you're you're still paying to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. And, and that's the simple fact is we're going to have to pay to remove from the atmosphere. You know, on that note, value stacking has become a very common concept right now in energy storage, a way to get energy storage financed uh, because energy storage has multiple values to utilities. I, I think it, uh, value stacking is an important concept here too. It's, you, know, you can get paid for the energy value of the biomass, but also paid for the carbon removal value as well. Excellent. Yeah, and a couple other questions came in. Roger, one of them. Could ahead. I say one word uh, about pricing? Uh, I mean, carbon pricing is very, very key elements for making this uh, carbon removal or other CCS technologies. In the IEA's net zero by 2050, the carbon price would be more than $200 by 2050. So how to make this kind of uh, transition smooth is how can we make a predictability or some kind of uh, 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 you know, stability of the price uh, in the future? So uh, carbon pricing by ETS uh, emission trading is one way. Another way is setting the uh, carbon tax uh, globally. And then we can give a very clear signal where the carbon price in the future would be $200, 200, uh, $150 by 2030, and $250 in 2050. If that is clear, I think this kind of technology could be readily available and, and investment would happen. And I think it's important well, to thank say you as far as developers go, there are places where those prices exist today. And so we can start deploying these technologies, try it out, and people can make money doing that, in particular in California. 
I appreciate those points. So several other questions came in that were a, a bit more technical. Uh, one question was just, how does the waste biomass that you talk about uh, compare to the on the order of 100 exajoules of biomass in, in total? And so just to set the, the overall perspective on that. And then Roger, another question came in that maybe you or Julio can address is how do you look at this versus um, biofuels to, to try to decarbonize some of the hard to abate uh, sectors such as uh, aviation or, or shipping? in terms of any analysis that you may have done comparing the, the value proposition here versus a, a biofuels pathway. Well, let me talk about that second question first. Um, the Using these things as biofuels is a great idea if you capture the carbon that you normally emit during processing. In almost any biofuel scheme, half the carbon that goes into the factory leaves from the smokestack. And so in, whether you're making jet fuel or diesel or hydrogen or anything else, capture that CO2 and get it underground and you will have a net negative bikers process. Right. Uh, my response in that same sensibility here is uh, twofold. First, let's be clear about this. There is no politician, there is no investor who wakes up in the morning and says, hmm, what's the thermodynamic and economic optimum? Uh, <laughs> Like, like these things are going to be put through a hurly burly of politics and markets, and we have to be humble about what we think we can actually do and control in those contexts. Um, but I will say that, uh, you know, biofuels and other applications. We looked, for example, at bio coke uh, production and use in steel making. There's lots of ways to use biomass. We have a preference to say they should be focused bioenergy applications on the hard to abate sectors because we have limited stocks. Uh, if we only have a limited amount of biomass, we should put it to use where the, the abatement will be most difficult to achieve. Even in that context, though, that's going to compete with everything. At the end of the day, Bikers is competing with BEX. Sustainable Aviation Fuels is competing with, with direct air capture. Uh, in some markets, these things are competing with renewables and electrification. And uh, if we can get to zero in some other market through some other technology, that's just going to be a straight up competition. The only way that will really work though and succeed is if you are technology agnostic about how you do it. That's why having these compliance markets and lots of options in them are so important because if you only have one or two options, you're going to increase cost and increase risk. Crystal clear. Thank you, Julio, for, for those thoughts. You know, I think you all touched on another, you know, important and critical aspect of this, of the, the social acceptability is key. And again, Julio, back to what you just mentioned, you know, that we, we want all kinds of mechanisms and all kinds of options. And, you know, there is no one size fits all best solution, but but all of these need to work together to achieve our, our common goals. I'd love to get your thoughts in terms of how we can help move the social acceptability of this concept forward, given that this is within the sea of, you know, lots of things and lots of acronyms. Um, thoughts on on how we can progress this. Julio. So I got a lot to say about this, but I want to go after Roger because Roger's got more to say about this and then I'll follow. You know, I, the first thing we have to do here is we have to start in the communities that are producing the biomass and make sure that we're paying attention to those communities' needs and concerns. And that's not that hard to do. So, you know, that's the first place. And the second place is to make sure that we have the right standards so that when, let's say if you're in Japan and you're purchasing biomass that you believe has a positive impact on the planet, that in fact, those standards are being met on by the producer and by the user. And so this global trade requires a clear set of standards and the enforcement of those standards when money is changing hands that the correct amount of carbon is changing hands. Great. Uh, the thing I would add to that is uh, there is a long arc of difficult work this century in social acceptability for everything. What we've talked about is not solely the province of biomass with carbon removal. Uh, we are having issues with social acceptability of green hydrogen, of industrial scale solar. Uh, every, all of the options that we have as they scale up and counter this challenge. And unfortunately, our world is kind of configured today to stop things. It is easy for people to say, I am not going to accept that. I want to fight it and stop it. That is immensely valuable. Uh, for too long, people have not had the agency or voice to avoid the harm in their own communities, as Roger said. I think though we have to be very proactive about building a collaborative sensibility. We, we have to figure out how to get to yes in all of these things. 
And these, that starts with conversations. It also, again, I, we keep coming back to this because it's so important. If you have standards that people agree on, then you have ground for agreement. You can start building from a place where everybody says, that's good enough, that's okay. And if you can build that carefully and well with voices from around the world, from the global north as well as the global south, from disadvantaged communities as well as investors, from experts and regulators together, then we got something. Uh, you know, there's you a very things. positive win-win set of opportunities here, win-win-win-win, um, where, where local communities benefit because their resources are being monetized in ways that they were not previously for the benefit of the global commons. But that requires, as both Roger and Julia have said, in, engaging local communities and making sure that they're part of the process. And I think if that happens, um, we can achieve you know, great things for these communities and for the world. Wonderful. Well, there's plenty more questions coming in, but I think in order to, uh, to end promptly on time, maybe I can segue to our last question for our, our guests and panelists here. You've mentioned it before in terms of, you know, some of the, the largest issues to address are institutional and, and, and you know, policy and, and political. They're not technical issues per se. Um, and, and again, you know, we've talked about some of these here, but as a sort of final thoughts from, from all of our panelists, David, I didn't know if you could begin to sort of reflect on, you know, you were instrumental in, in founding DeSEM. Right, and so some thoughts of what types of platforms that try to pull together, like what we're trying to do here, government policymakers and industry leaders and financial institutions that all want to pull together to Julio, as you said, you know, lean forward and not say what we need to stop, but what we need to, you know, accelerate and, and, and push forward together on. And then really to get all the panelists to talk about if there's a key lasting, you know, message you would have to, you know, government leaders around the globe working together to progress this, you know, what are your key messages of what we could all do to to facilitate bikers and this concept um, getting traction and accelerating uh, moving forward. So maybe David, we can start and then we can go to Julio and Roger and Nobua perhaps finish with you. Thanks, Jared. Yeah, it's, it's very rewarding to participate uh, in this dialogue and not just because I'm excited about bikers uh, getting more attention, but uh, thinking back to the founding of the, of the SEM 11 years ago now, this is exactly the type of dialogue that we hope the SEM could promote. Um, with, with governments coming together globally uh, and, and talking about a new cutting edge topic and figuring out ways to work together. And of course, at the time we didn't contemplate Zoom or, or you know, other types of remote platforms, which even makes it easier. Uh, but it's just, it's wonderful to see. And uh, you know, one, one thought I've had as this hour has progressed is what a perfect platform the Sen is for further dialogue in this. And so, you know, may, maybe a next step is some type of SEM bikers initiative. All, all it would take is one government that wants to do that and what brings on a couple of other governments and, and, and maybe that makes sense. Um, uh, I think there are other international fora um, where there could be platforms. The Framework Convention, as we've already mentioned, is one. You know, There's this so-called Red Plus platform within the Framework Convention, which has been an important forum for discussion of related issues. And the Framework Convention could host a platform on on these issues as well. Um, uh, I, I think um, of all the issues that, that we've discussed, I think the standard setting and the building up of social acceptability in this area is probably among the most important. Um, and I would just stress, as I did in my last set of remarks, that there really is a win-win-win set of opportunities here, um, where communities benefit, where nations benefit, where the globe benefits. Thanks. And, and, and thanks, Jared, to you, and thanks for ISEF for, for all the support on this topic. Absolutely. Thank you, David. Julio, quick thoughts? Uh, very quick. Uh, bikers represents to me the three things that you need to make progress in climate. You need ambition to drive down emissions. You need humility about how hard it is. <laughs> and you need money. And if we can marshal those together in a useful way, uh, bikers can be an immensely useful platform. Thank you, Julio. Roger, your quick ending comments. This is an opportunity for countries to do demonstrations. We always think in terms of technology, but we've pointed out that the social issues and the regulations need to be demonstrated as well. And that's a place where countries can step up and say, we're going to show that this works. Thank you, Roger. Tanak? Uh, 
Yeah, I talk about this net zero uh, by 2050, the IEA's roadmap. Do you have any final thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, yes, um, uh, yes. I, I mentioned about this transformation uh, or milestones, uh, which are uh, described, uh, proposed by the net zero emission by 2050, the IEA's new roadmap. And it, it was criticized a lot because it's uh, extremely impossible really to do this kind of a huge uh, transformation. So the how much speed can we really achieve this transformation depends on how what kind of action we can take together uh, all over the countries. Well, even with geopolitical uh, conflict between the United States and China, there are some um, understanding that we have to work together for climate change mitigation. So this is a very uh, common front where everybody can work together. Even the private sector is forced by the market. ExxonMobil is accept uh, you know, three board members by the active, uh, let's say, uh, investors. And uh, Shell is litigated by the local court in the Netherlands to reduce carbon emissions. So the transformation by the market is much, much uh, faster and demanding uh, than we had expected. And COVID-19 is definitely pushing us and because the people's concern about safety and security is the real thing. So at least we have to prepare for that kind of future is coming. And uh, without uh, preparing, we will lose everything. So um, action, uh, not only talk, but action is uh, what we need to do. And uh, SEM, as Green Energy Ministerial, is certainly the very interesting uh, and important platform. And ISEF, uh, what we are doing, can also contribute for the future uh, collaboration for action. And thank you very much for providing us this opportunity on the bikers. Uh, you're very welcome. And thank you all for, uh, for joining us as our guest speakers and panelists today. Again, I think that's a great way to end a call to action, a call for all of us to work together to progress uh, this uh, concept and a broader uh, agenda to get us to where we all want to be in terms of achieving net zero goals. So I'd like to thank our audience for your time and attention. I'll hand it back over to Kevin uh, for some closing uh, comments and housekeeping remarks. Kevin. Sure, thank you. Um, and thanks everyone for sticking around. I know we're uh, a couple of minutes past, but I'll quickly wrap up here. Um, there's a couple of links on the sl uh, this slide here. If you'd like to learn more about the SAM CCUS initiative, uh, please reach out or visit the channels provided here. Uh, and to stay up to date on news and developments of the initiative, uh, follow us on LinkedIn and on Twitter as well. Uh, in this case, um, Google might be your friend as, as many of these links and profiles can be found by a simple search of uh, SAM CCUS initiative. So one final time, I'd like to extend a thank you to our, our panelists uh, and to our attendees, of course, for participating in today's webinar. Uh, we very much appreciate your time. Uh, please enjoy the rest of your day, and we hope to see you again at future events. Thank you. This concludes our webinar.